Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. Going to continue our coverage of Wizard Magazine today, but before we do, a couple of announcements. First, Red Room trigger warnings. Final order cutoff on the second season of Red Room. This collection is Monday, so let your comic shop know today that you want a copy of Red Room trigger warnings. Also, we have a very busy October here at Cartoonist Kayfabe. We're going to be appearing at CXC in uh, October 6th through the 9th. We'll be doing some panels, signing books, selling books there. Same with Baltimore Comic Con to close out the month. And I will be at the Jacksonville Public Library in the middle of the month for a zine fest and a lit chat there. We also invite everybody to like, follow, and subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Hit that bell icon to be notified when we have a new video. That'll allow you to get ahead of the Kayfabe effect. When we post a video on a comic book, sometimes those books disappear quickly or the prices go up. So if you have that notification turned on, you'll be the first one tracking down those books. And also let these videos play through to the end. That allows YouTube's algorithm to share them with other comics fans. It's one of the ways we grow this channel and we appreciate your help on that. But today, Ed, we are here to continue looking at Wizard Magazine, this time issue number 49 from September 1995. I'm starting college at this point. And a uh, pretty hot cover here by a very young, talented superstar artist, Joe Mad, doing the X-Men at this time. Is he 20 or something at this point? As per the, the article inside, he is. There's going to be some fun digging into that because uh, it's exciting to see somebody that young having this level of success. And you see it right on the cover, you know, the heroes and the villains in his inimitable style. Absolutely, man. Uh, I think this issue is a good <clears throat> signifier of comics evolution in terms of mainstream comics there's a lot of stuff in here that points to the future and uh the cover is no exception you know joe mad will, will go on to do some big things before he basically gets the hell out of comics Which also the uh the, the color that i'm so fast to, to criticize on everything some of the lack of color theory here well on display something we would see blues. for the next decade <laughs> blues just bleeding into each other man absolutely <laughs> absolutely but we remove that as best we can from our from our observation and the, we look at the hallmarks of like what is joe mad and one of the things that he mentioned like you can find interviews online and stuff is he would get the laser discs to shit like uh the fatal fury anime and stuff and with with that at your disposal when you hit pause you're getting a clear image rather than if you do that stuff on VHS, right? Where the image, it's basically, there's like a little governor that just shoots out and stops the tape, but the tape still yes. wants to go. <laughs> and the tape is oscillating back we and forth. We are dating ourselves with this one. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he was co he was copying imagery from, from like anime. And you see the way he builds some of these figures. Uh, Bob Harris described his style as bouncy and, 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 and you can easily see what he means by that. That tapered waist with that, that sort of big upper body, that kind of exaggeration, one of the hallmarks, and one of the things that, you know, as silly as it may sound, that he brought to comics uh, after he started, maybe it was even after this fucking cover, when he draws like one bigger eye, one smaller eye, and these mouths like that. I mean, let's start naming, you can start naming the dudes <laughs> who, who, who cribbed that, like directly from him. I like the mouths a lot, though. That feels like an original piece that he brings. You know, like, right. like a lot of these cartoonists have their grimacing style for the mouth. That's a pretty good one. Very cartoony, but also very clearly expressive. You know the note that I would have for, we know a lot of cartoonists and, and aspiring cartoonists watch this. Put your signature on the front cover. It's a gatefold, man. Put that signature right down here is, uh, it would be my takeaway from this piece. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. But he has a good enough command of anatomy and stuff. Like, he likes manga. And but he also has the chops of American comics. Probably well, we'll get we'll get into that interview whenever. Yeah, this is a pretty comics. fun issue. You know, I'm I'm uh, as we've been going through these wizards, I think they're hit and miss. <laughs> a lot of them. There's a lot of hit in this one. Uh, cool to see Vampirilla. You know, kind of like coming back in as the uh, bad girls continue to ramp up. Mark Silvestri getting some coverage there in your uh, table of contents page. And um, am I missing a page? No. I am. I am indeed. My uh, second secondhand market copy. Somebody really liked this Van <laughs> Vampirella Strikes Number One <laughs> ad and uh, gave that a yank. <laughs> Probably more than one yank. Yeah, I think so, man. <laughs> um, it's Jimmy, funny. This is should... a new model, by the way, because the the original model had moved on to Evangeline uh, Rob, Rob Liefeld. Rob Liefeld pulled some of that pretty Tony shit. 
yo, you know the rules of the game. She chose me. Now yes. we can handle that like gentlemen, or we could get into some gangster shit. <laughs> and the people at Harris Comics were like, well, we'll just get a new chick. Yes, and uh, whoever owned this wizard before me really liked her. Jim, I hate that you're <laughs> using your bare hands going through it. I almost want to give you rubber gloves, my yes. man. Yes. This is, uh, we, we need to do this like Billy Ireland CXC style and uh, handle this with care for my skin. And you know what? For the people out there, if you got comics on the secondhand market uh, during the bad girl era, maybe you do the same. Maybe you run the black light over it. That's right. And see if it's acceptable. <laughs> Uh, not much in the in the Seamus front piece here. Starting to plug the next issue, which is the big 50th anniversary issue. So some oversized stuff there, but not a whole lot there. Man, Techno Comics, much bigger footprint than I remembered, Ed. Just go back real quick. This is very significant uh, to see an actual like dot com. Uh, we we really haven't seen that kind of that much stuff with dot com. There would be websites, but it would have tildes and slashes and be a part of some internet service provider or something. That's pretty huge. That's an interesting note. That's a good one because there'll be another one later on in this issue, I think, with uh, some, I think it's AOL having yeah. a double page spread ad in there. Um, any letters stand out to you? No. Yeah, me either. But I will point out the man bat issue and we'll get a news item on this, but John Bolton doing the painting, noteworthy to me. I feel like he's a, uh, a pretty exceptional cartoonist, artist, painter, and uh, don't get a ton of work from him. So this was a big project for him, three issues. Absolutely. And I uh, had no idea this existed. Yeah, I don't, I've never seen it. Um, I mean, I've probably seen covers, but I've never read it, I should mm -hmm. say. There's your plug for Wizard 50. Todd McFarlane, man, was on issue one's cover with Spider-Man and uh, still the big player in the game. So going to get a lot of coverage he, in issue 50. He really marketed himself. We're going to look at a Denny O'Neill interview where he said that maybe he and Neil Adams were kind of the first comic uh, superstars. But, quote unquote, there is no machinery to exploit that. Things have changed in like the 90s and when there's four Spider-Man titles, but it's yours that sells over a, mil a couple of million copies and the other ones are doing in a couple hundred thousands, it's clearly you who's doing it and uh, there's avenues to promote yourself. And on the toy commercials, he's the guy in his Canadian tuxedo walking around through broken walls, selling you spawn toys at the very beginning of the HBO show. I think on the intro piece, it's, it has the animation uh, like intercut with him, Tom McFarland inking. And then the first five minutes, it's like him doing his best, like Rod Serling, talking, telling us about the bana banality of evil and shit like that. It's really interesting to think of how those guys sort of manage that. Uh, they're, they're, I don't know, celebrity and how they, they parlayed that, you know, because like you see shades of... Stan Lee, obviously, you know, is a self-promoter, and these guys all kind of, like, did different things with that. McFarlane yeah. really uh, seems to have learned from some of those past masters. This is one letter that stood out a little bit, and it's this idea of Frank Miller and Jim Shooter being at odds, um, you know, with who did what and what credit deserves what. And I, the guy asked, like, they should do a debate because they have very conflicting stories as to what happened uh, during Shooter's time at Marvel. I don't know that we'll ever sort that stuff out, but kind of fun to see that brought to attention. I saw a fantastic video on YouTube just yesterday uh, while eating breakfast, man. It was from Larry King Live in like 1990, and there was some Frederick Wortham Light kind of character out there, some doctor guy who was bringing, up, bringing back like all that sort of anti-violent like comic sentiment while they are showing imagery from year one like you know with like and a naked policeman is tied up and bound and like you know like this kind of shit uh dennis kitchen is the guy on our side who's doing the talk in there omaha the cat dancer is the comic they keep kept they keep yes. showing um but frank miller calls in and was extremely cogent and smart about like his thoughts on the matter it was it was a good episode yeah. i recommend it yeah that was kind of his cause uh his, his big cause for a long time the whole rating stuff uh, cards are still a big piece of the advertising. This was funny to see because uh, Dave McKean light. Yes. You know, like he's he's affecting the culture, uh, and that is a tremendous example of that. Yeah. Also, the early, uh, your digital design, right, where you're doing outlines around your letters and black on oh, black. Oh, just and... wait till we see page one of the fucking Joe Matt article. <laughs> John Paul Leone, dude. Yeah, how about that? I right, like he's... his art. Strong from the beginning, too, because I wonder even if he might have still been a student at this point, you yeah, know, like 95. SBA. Well, Simonson is your teacher. That's a good pedigree to come from. 
Yeah, somebody mentioned the uh, that that Superman annual that he drew and Simonson wrote, and uh, I was unaware of that. So that's on my list, my short list of uh, reading. <laughs> Fabian Nicieza, K. Yes. Fabian, walking away from the X Men uh, regular series, talking about it not being fun to work on. Doesn't get into specifics. I feel like all these people that walk away from the uh, a book like X Men, it's usually based on crossovers and coordinating storylines and just too much of that nonsense. Because he says he still plans to do uh, special projects, one shots, has a saber tooth one shot in the works. That would be terrible as a writer, I think. You know, like one of the things, like it was just impossible at in North Carolina to get into it because it was pretty much Chris Claremont centric. But I had Louis Simonson up on the dais as well, and uh, had about. 10 minutes to talk to her because Chris like broke his ankle or something had a heart like took him a long time to get up to the convention floor and so we're up there filibustering and I'm, I'm the second question I was going to ask her was about like what is it like writing by committee in this that certain way because she did that with New Mutants with all those crossovers I mean she created they created the crossover right. with um, Mutant Massacre and then carrying it on like in her Superman work you know, she did have opportunity, to, like through power pack and things, to just kind of do her deal. But more often than not, she's part of this like weird machine. We need to bring her on because I am curious about that Superman. To me, again, we talk about writers' rooms in comics. To me, that's one of the the closest examples to a writers' room, and I'd be curious what how, how she reacted to that. Um, Batman Daredevil crossover planned here. We're going to see another crossover listed later on. And uh, we've looked at some of these crossovers. You know, I think this is a, another sign of the uh, the times as comics are going down. <laughs> Start doing crossovers, hot shotting, whatever you can do to sell some books. And there's a little more information on John Bolton doing the uh, Batman Man Bat series. Wild Store returns to Image without Jerry Ordway. Oh my goodness! Highly controversial. <laughs> yeah, and and hoping. Uh, they ask him about, you know, the markets not doing well, but he says it seems to be turning around as banking on the market's continued improvement. Not so much. That's the other thing. It, this issue, it really, there's a paradigm shifting moment, like with this issue, because we're going to see a lot of the future of comics. With Joe Mad, uh, they're highlighting writers who, you know, a good percentage of them do become like the next round of guys. But throughout this thing, we're seeing different kinds of language that, that, that we're seeing today ho hoping for uh, market recovery is this a dead cat bounce like you're seeing all that kind of talk because speculators are a part of this shit uh in the submissions article like there's there's a piece at the end like you know hope for a bounce back right uh you know i think more than anything ed when you talk about this issue being like that crossroads issue having an article like this too in the middle of that conversation I mean, it really is shades of today's comics world, right? Like, oh, a new a new Batman movie is big deal, you know, big business, and uh, just like today. Although I often think, like, how many freaking Batman movies? I was on the plane, and it's like, I don't know, there's nine Batman movies available from all these different eras, and it's like, how excited can you be for a new Batman movie at this point? <laughs> like, what hasn't been done in those movies? Right. Yeah. G.I. Joe going to Dark Horse? It's funny, uh, there's a mention in here about how in mid-94, mm -hmm. so say a year before this issue, Rob Liefeld announces that his Image Studios, or uh, Extreme Studios, secured the Joe license. And I guess nothing came of that, but uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, I wonder if it was one of those things where it was close and then Rob, you know, the Extreme guys like wanted to nudge it somehow in the press and sort of hold Hasbro's feet to the fire, but... I mean, I have no idea, right? Made me think of, uh, you know, like he finally gets to do Joe comics uh, a couple years ago with that Snake Eyes Absolutely. comic. Absolutely. So really cool. Neat. Um, and they talk about how it's only been something like, I don't know, like a couple of months or something since, since like Joe has been seen in comics. It makes me very curious, too, that, uh, you know, because they, they say, like, the licensing that Dark Horse has done is part of the reason why Hasbro, you know, well, look, who knows what the real reason is, but it's part of the spin on the PR as, like, they're good with licensed properties. I never read any of the Dark Horse G.I. Joe comics. I don't think they made too many of they those. They made six. And the it makes me curious about, like, it just tanked, yeah, right? Yeah, I, I, I have them, and it's a whole different set of people. So, so like... It's Joe in name only, in title only. Uh, the the toys that they made from that are like 
a little they're di they're just different there's no like there's no snake eyes who's a part of it and in fact you know they're slick about it on the co that frank miller cover it's a dude with like a army helmet with like Mer american flag draped around him in, in silhouette so that you have to like imagine what joe that is you have to put your own joe onto it because you're getting no characters that you care about and it's not it's not like gi joe the brand is the thing it's like you know the characters that motherfuckers grew up with yeah uh and that was not th that was not that so then that miniseries comes out it's like another five years before um josh blaylock gets it with devils do you know it just languishes for a while you know what man it really that really is the timetable because like the first show i did at pittsburgh i was next to him mm -hmm. and he was talking about trying to get that license and then i think i saw him again i don't know six or eight months later at some show and he had it and he was super excited so it really was about five years exactly yeah that's a good memory on your part Ed. i remember uh, josh blaylock man penguin bros was the comic he was hustling <laughs> as a yeah. kid um hey i want to note ac comics this is fem force they're celebrating their 10th anniversary is what's noted here so think like 1985 maybe they start ac comics that is still they're still publishing today they are dude at our last uh, pittsburgh comic con back in like you know the early aughts 2005 or something they put us in this little alley and uh it was you me and tom on one side and it was the ac comics guy <laughs> on the other and uh i don't think anybody came through our aisle that whole time but but even that shocked me in like two, in 2005 that ac comics was was still happening it was not bill black who was chilling like across the way from us it was some yeah, if you dig into friend. his his history, I think he goes back publishing into maybe even the late sixties, definitely in the seventies. He was so. in fandom, you know. He was he was publishing fanzines and shit in the sixties for sure. It's it's one of those things. Like I wish I knew more about that history of that company, but some of the stuff that comes out becomes collector's items, and then it's just like impossible to track down the books that have like a little history on on AC Comics for some reason. Right. Um, Sam and Max. We've looked at Sam and Max in the past, so anybody that's curious about this title may want to give our video on Sam and Max a look. But uh, good cartooning, Steve Purcell, um, I don't know, roommates of Mignola and Art Adams, yeah, I, I believe. Yeah, part of the little tri trinity there. Uh, a very good cartoonist that went on to work in video games. And, and currently is working at Pixar. <clears throat> so he has an amazing uh, career. And Sam and Max is one of those uh, properties. Like, he's a guy that I would love to talk to because he was forward-thinking enough to hold on to the to the rights to his characters so you could see it's i think it was published by if if my memory doesn't uh, escape me uh by fish wrap press like they're like the fish police people i think did an issue <laughs> maybe the first issue kamiko mm -hmm. epic yeah it was serialized in like a lucas arts gaming magazine in color and this is the first trade paperback that collects all that material you know because you had to you had to chase and hunt and those comics were expensive like the sam and max fan fandom like i i personally like when i worked at that call center growing up there was a dude he did not read comics but he read sam and max and he sought out all sam and max comics like that was his kind of like style of entertainment of stuff that he liked to draw on things and it really spoke to him uh but purcell is in this uh, interview this little blurb just talking about how people would come up to him and say like how do I get Sam and Max comics and he just he didn't have a good answer to tell people because it's like yeah you gotta it's long out of print you gotta like go to a comic shop and pay $30 for 30 pages of comics just put out a trade paperback but the fucked up thing is that this paperback comes out around this this time sells like freaking hotcakes and it's t another 20 years mm, at least 10 years uh, because I knew you when the Telltale Games trade paperback came out collecting all that stuff. And all of them now are giant prices. Yeah, I guess. It's right. like impossible to get this comic at a reasonable price. So maybe, uh, maybe Steve, it's, it's time for another, another reissue of this material. Yeah. Um, Mars Attacks. Mars Attacks being one of those, uh, as long as Topps is publishing comics, it seems like Mars Attacks is, is coming, coming along. Um, I picked up one of those recently out of a dollar bin that has a really uh, a fun cover. Maybe I'll flash it on screen because it's, it's kind of noteworthy. I like that Wizard would cover animation, notable animation figures, because this is somebody like I just don't know history of animation. So for all the uh, criticisms I often have about Wizard magazine, I feel like it's nice to see this kind of coverage. Yeah. But like give us some uh, celebrate some of these. It's, it's not 
comics per se, but it is cartooning and there's certainly overlap. So I appreciate some of the history of that. And that's probably uh, Patrick O'Neill's doing that, yeah. uh, that this kind of stuff gets coverage. Sure. Did this image Extreme 3000 stuff ever see the late of day? Because I don't think it did. I don't think so either. They had four titles planned, Prophet, Supreme, Youngblood, and New Men. <laughs> <laughs> new men <laughs> Todd Knock represent uh, 3000 and they make note that it is this is not like uh, Marvel's 2099 line it's one number higher <laughs> yeah exactly um, oh. I never I've never seen any of this so I don't know that this came out I, I think not and and I wonder if Marvel didn't do a uh, hey cease and desist but also <laughs> I think this is around the time that like Maximum Press is starting you know I think Rob Life on Extreme Studios a lot's going on you can so. see Maximum Press right there in the mix man so it's a very curious thing where Rob Rob has has two companies. You know, he's putting out stuff through Image, but but then he's he's got Maximum Press going. And uh, three thought. Imagining, th you know, a thousand years in the future, uh, when we talk about Kirby and how he always projected stuff being like thirty years ahead, like like that feels more sound. You know, like you could you could imagine that a little bit better than. I, I wouldn't want to trust the Extreme Studios boys to, to imagine 3,000 years in the future. Yeah, right. Although uh, I, I would criticize Marvel's 2099 line for the same exact thing. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know that that was too uh, futuristic in a lot of ways. Right. Conan versus Rune coming up. This is Barry Windsor Smith coming back to Conan, a big deal. Um, probably any time. If he were to do a Conan project today, it would be big news, I think, in comic circles. Obviously, the guy that was associated with Conan coming to comics. So returning there to team up with one of his latest creations in Rune and a pretty interesting looking comic. Again, we've done crossover episodes and, and looked at that briefly. So might be worth digging into, but again, feels like hot shotting. You know, you get this artist, two people, fans have wanted to see team up or return to this character and now uh, do a crossover, bring the talent in. Kind of cool. I bought it off the stands and, and kept it through my purge. So I'm one of those marks. Kyle Hotz on the up-and-coming cartoonist list. I always associate his work, um, one with Outlaw Comics Absolutely. and two with Kelly Jones. Yeah. And he names Kelly Jones as one of his influences, Sam Keith, Bernie Wrightson, other influences. Usually liked his art whenever I would come across it. I think he's in the in the Kayfabe audience too, man. I've seen his name pop up and stuff, man. So shouts to Kyle Hotz. But the, the names that he, that he mentions as being inspirations or people he wants to work with, it's all Outlaw. And you can see from this thumbnail image... <clears throat> That he's pulling from that sensibility in a giant way. You know, he's mentioned James O'Barr, yeah. Kelly Jones, Mike Barron. Yeah, uh, I think he's had a long career, too. I, I think he may still be active as a, as a cartoonist, but I've seen his work on a lot of books. Yeah, so, he's like um, that late period uh, North Star kind of. Right, like he exactly would show up right. in, in that era of stuff. Yeah, Cold Blooded was one of his titles from North Star, and I see that in Dollar Bins, and, I, and you can find it in my, my own box. Comic Absolutely. Boxes. I have uh, many copies. <clears throat> Whenever I see it, I grab it. Yeah. Steady Costumer, Uncanny X Men penciler Joe Mad talks about redesigning the X Men. Here at Cartoonist Kayfabe, we aren't just making videos about comics, we're making comics themselves, and we've got some big releases coming up this fall. Ed Piscor's Red Room, Trigger Warnings, collecting the second season of Red Room, is available in stores in September, but you can pre-order that now wherever you order books or comics. You want to pick that up now in time for the uh, Christmas rush, because the way printing and paper shortages are, you want to make sure you pre-order this book to make sure you don't miss out, because once these are gone, it may take a minute or two to get the reprints, and you don't want to be stuck this holiday season without it. My Hulk Grand Design book, the retelling of the 60-year history of the Incredible Hulk, will be in stores in December in time for Christmas. Again, you need to pre-order that book now. Let Marvel know how many of these things to print. This is the best book that I have made. Marvel let me design this book. It's going to be a big, oversized, neon green book that you will want to add to your collection. Put a red bow on it, stick it under the Christmas tree for the Hulk fan in your life. And Street Angel, Deadly Girl Live from Image Comics, has been out of print for almost a year. We'll be back in print by the end of August or early September, so... Put that on your pull list now at your local comic sh shop or online wherever you get books. And now back to our regular scheduled programming. Is he 14? <laughs> he looks like an anime girl. He started working at Marvel at the age of 16 while he was attending the uh, School of Arts and Science in Manhattan. I believe that is uh, the school where Bernie Krigstein taught, I yeah, think. I think Stan Lee went there. I think Blue Elder went there. Like, yeah, long history Harvey of Kurtzman. talent. Maybe New Adams. Yeah, it's, it's really... Uh, 
Well, I mean, the, the 16 is what really blows my mind. Like, he was, he started interning at Marvel, but also getting work on, like, Marvel Comics Presents. We looked at one of his early stories. We did. I did not realize he was that young whenever he was doing that work. Yeah. That's amazing. This is, you know, this is one of those issues, dude, that, uh, that I scooped up in 1995. I'm 13. So seeing that kind of thing is mind-blowing, and it is making me put my head down, put the baseball glove away, screw all frivolity. It's like this dude did his first job at 16. He's exceptional. Like, he, like his drawing ability is very strong. And uh, like sort of the growth that I had going to art school was rapid. And it benefited from other people who could break stuff down and, and, and sh just visual learners uh, by and large people who who draw on things so he went to a school where that's being done as a kid he's interning at marvel and getting to see the most amazing amazing pages in pencil and black and white like this is that outlier thing where it's not about just ten thousand hours practice you got to have luck involved and he had proximity yeah um he's 20 you know the, the article starts off with him saying that he's 20 here and he's doing X-Men. He's the regular X-Men artist. The at biggest this title in comics. And it makes me think like Bob Harris. You know, is he chasing lightning in a bottle with some of this stuff too? Because this is the guy who hires Rob Liefeld whenever he's a, a teenager in early 20s. And, you know, you see the success of New Mutants, Cable, X-Force, Deadpool. Um, you're hoping to get that same kind of lightning where you get this young guy on here. And Bob Harris talks about he thinks X-Men should be having a young artist on it makes sense based on, you know, Bob Harris's v vision of what X-Men is and I kind of like that attitude but man you know from Bob Harris's standpoint lucky to find a Joe Mad because it's not like there are other tw too many 20 year olds that would be capable of doing that level of work absolutely man and and uh it, it this is also one of those uh, shining examples and you learn that in art school also that like you know you, the like the administration will have a lot of these like rules and mandates involved but it doesn't apply to everybody, uh, especially if you're good. So this kid does not make his deadlines, really. He's doing his best. Bob Harris literally says, and, and this is probably like that thing, you know, I said in some video with Tom last week that like uh, the, the elementary school teacher maxim is don't smile till Christmas. Like maybe you don't put in print all is forgiven when those pages come in, you know, like Bob Harris says that in, yeah, this, in this interview <laughs> and uh, like, maybe you just don't say that there's going to be future imagery if, uh, in here where they do little highlights and stuff of Joe Mad and get to see in his studio. If I remember correctly, you see stuff like the Buster Sword from Final Fantasy seven, you know, a real big thick joint that's real long. You see little materia uh, merchandise from Final Fantasy seven. I, I don't remember seeing a drawing table. <laughs> uh, you see a Sega Saturn and you see PlayStation, but I do not remember seeing a drawing table in that in that studio. I I, I truly can be wrong. That's funny. He uh, he's redesigning some of the costumes for the X characters and gives Dave Cockrum the the shout out for saying that's his favorite era of costumes. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you know, for somebody that age to uh, be a little bit of a comics historian. Um, I like seeing that. The, f the four issues of Astonishing X-Men during the Age of Apocalypse were his most consecutive issues uh, to date as per this this article. So four is what he's able to manage to get uh, in a row. Bob Harris is like, I would like to think that this kid is will be able to get 12 issues in in a year at some point. My, uh, my collection goes up through that run. I don't think I have his complete, but I have a lot of it. And what would happen is this is... This is that, you know, nature abhors a vacuum thing where you would pick up the next fucking issue and it's like, ah, it's just say is this, as the kids say, hits differently. And it's like, oh, it's Roger Cruz. And then there will be like promo cuts within the pages where Joe Mad is putting on newspaper, like Cruz swipes again and shit like oh, that, geez. dude. So, so he wasn't <clears throat> all that appreciative of, um of the cribbing and then and then it goes it goes beyond just like the uh with that young roger cruz it goes beyond just the joe mad with the eyes and the mouth and the proportions and stuff because people will like find like otomo backgrounds and shit that he would just like fully lift and stuff 
he did these uh, issues of Excalibur. Like they're they're just like making note of like the various co- comics that he did in his early days, and I picked those up off the rack. And would, like if you go through my stuff, like those are like the Excalibur comics that I have. And it was totally randomly of just like this looks pretty freaking cool. You know, no context of that dude. Like I mean, you know, the week those comics came out, like he had no name, but they were he was fly from the jump. Yeah. Yeah, I think the first thing I saw of his was Deadpool, which I guess he would have been 18 whenever he did that Deadpool miniseries. Yeah. Because it's like two years before this this article. And um, I knew that he was young. You know, yeah. like he was a new artist. I probably knew it from Wizard, you know, like new new young artist or something tagged in one of those uh, Deadpool promos. And that was real appealing to me because when he was new, I think Mark Farmer inked him. So he kind of rounds out some of the more sharp, stylistic edges that, that would emerge they would still be there but it was pretty good stuff like it was good he, enough that i bought the whole miniseries he was a superstar like at, at that point man like people people really knew his name and stuff with with that miniseries absolutely yeah and i mean to be 18 and doing work of that that caliber again like just nobody really does that you could just look at this pencil piece right I like there that a lot and you can like that is the future of comics at after after this point for years you know like that humberto ramos like mm-hmm. impulse comics and shit would look like this like he spawned generations uh like like he spawned a generation of artists like the the wild storm dudes will start to turn into him like that la garza shit that's him it's not jim lee it's it's joe mad wannabe shit man that's a good point and it's a good eye on bob harris to find another guy like that who's not just a jim lee clone but bringing something new and Completely. something that's uh, inspiring to a lot of a lot of fans. Um, this is kind of fun. He was asked to do some like Avengers revamp, some of the Avengers designs, and he did a series of those, a round of those with some of the characters, and then basically walked away from that because I uh, recognized that like if I want to do X Men three twenty five, if I want to do X Men twelve issues run. Like, got to start saying no to some of this stuff that sounds really cool. But imagine trying to turn down stuff like, hey, redesign some Avengers for us, age 20-year-old, uh, you know, hotshot <laughs> young guy. Um, but, you know, kind of an acknowledgement of that. And I think that a lot of artists have that realization of, like, you just can't do everything. Right. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a thing where, like, especially, like, he, I mean, he's, he's a different case because he basically, it doesn't sound like he ever had a job. Like, right. Like, he ever, you know, worked at the video store or something like that. But the way you're sort of taught and sort of the smart way to go you know you see it online where it's like you work you, it, it, the art thing is a side hustle until it matches or goes beyond what your primary source of income is and then you could quit your primary source of income take those jobs but with that mindset when you when you're building your career in that way and now art has taken over the what, what used to be your primary prim, primary source of income it's scary to say no like, it's a very privileged position to be able to go, nah, I'm just going to stick with this, man. Because for a while, you're chasing that loot in a way. Like, that's, that's that job mentality, right? Where, like, you need to fucking pay your rent and stuff. And you can get caught up forever in selling your labor for a dollar and create a comic book career that is no different than my dad working at the fucking Homestead Mill, where you are just getting a check every month for labor rather than royalties and building your own assets through this medium of comics. We're going to get a little bit more of this later in the issue. Oh, oh, I should say that's, that's all I got on the Joe mad article. Yeah. Yeah, um, but this dark side versus Galactus ad, we're going to get more on this later in the issue. So I won't dwell on it now, but right. pretty fun to see it there. Yeah. How to sell yourself. Artist editors and art directors offer 10 key tips for your portfolio and for getting a job. So, uh, gotta love this article. Yeah. Loved it, love it now. Would have loved it back then. And uh, let's then. just go, go through these tips. Grab some FaceTime. Basically try to track down these editors and publishers at conventions. This, this, was, this was a tough one for me because like, I just went to Pittsburgh Comic Con. There was no way I was gonna convince my pops to take vacation time to take me to an important comic convention in a big city or something. So I would bring my portfolio to the Pittsburgh Comic Con, but I've shown it to only people who, like nobody who could help me. Right. With the exception of, there would be independent guys there, and maybe, you know, if you blew their mind, you might get like a pinup or something, or, or uh, asked to do a backup story. That, like, that's a possibility. Certainly wasn't a possibility for a young Eddie P at all. 
Yeah, this this has changed a lot, I think, over the years because you just don't see editors at very many of these shows anymore. You know, it's maybe Comic Con, uh, San Diego, New York, like you said. Yeah, I and think, that might be about it. I think Baltimore has a thing, and and I actually do think it's it's actually ramped up more uh, now that sort of the the rules have changed since you know people sued Marvel DC for saying that they, their ideas were stolen. Yeah. So now you like literally have to like. You can't send cold submissions anymore, man. You gotta like sign waivers, and you gotta like show your portfolio and like talk with these guys. And it has to be this very regimented thing. They will not accept cold solicit unsolicited submissions anymore because of those changes. So, so people really like fucked up the the industry. Do comics? Yeah, they don't want just pinups. And man, they got John Romita Senior weighing in on that. Uh, Brian Polito, who is probably top of his game here at Chaos Comics. That was always a common thing I would hear, though. You know, you know it's like, you got to do sequential stuff. You know how I said, like, like there are exceptions to every rule? Uh, somebody sent us that Wildstorm, um, what do you call it, man? That, like, oral history mm -hmm. book. And when Jim Lee put out a talent search, there's a piece in there, man, where uh, J. Scott Campbell sent a page of comics and like a two page spread. I think it might be seven panels total across three <laughs> pages or some shit. And they called him up like the next week. Yeah. And we're like, you want you why don't you come over? <laughs> That's wild. Um don't focus on the presentation. You know what, before we get to number three though, man, the, like they lay out these examples and there are these test scripts that you can get from like Dark Horse or whatever. And this is the equivalent, you know, cartoonist kayfabe wrestling jargon right they stretch motherfuckers with <laughs> with with these with these bullshit with these bullshit tests scripts dude a civilian walks out of a city park across a busy street to an apartment building he goes up the ele elevator and enters his living room and a superhero and supervillain break through the wall I mean that's stretching, right? That's Oli Anderson fucking snapping your <laughs> that's jaw. Right. That's true, yeah. <laughs> and then you do that, and you're sweating, and you're beaten and haggard, but you come back for more. That's real funny. Yeah, you're you're right about that. Um, I got hold of one of those scripts, though. You know, that's what Ernie Steiner gave me from a Batman, like a Batman sample script to uh, to practice early on whenever I was trying to get in here. You know what I would say for an update of Do Comics uh, in today's world? It is like do your own comics. Do, yeah, you know, whether comics. that's web comics or making making zines or whatever, like. Make those comics because there are ways to get them in front of people, and that's another way now to get attention. Is uh, if you build an audience, you know that's how you. That's one way to get get seen. I would say, I mean, like my generation, like that's that's what my generation did. It has nothing to do with Marvel DC, man. Like like Simon was a Tumblr god, and like really even expanded his audience so much more on Instagram. Like I have Boing Boing to thank for Hip Hop Family Tree. Uh, so many people just did like dedicated web comics. Dash Shaw websites. sent uh, bottomless belly button to Fanographics as like a six hundred page submission. So yeah. yeah, like make 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 your comics. So I think do comics is a good a good piece, but do comics that you can do something with too on your own because yeah. there's not just one avenue anymore that these gatekeepers have to greenlight you. Polito's the funniest in this whole thing, man, because he's he's acting like like you know he's he's a hard taskmaster, this Brian Polito fella. He's got something to say in every in every chapter. Don't focus on the presentation. Um, I don't know, man. This is. I, I don't take much from this. Yeah, well, you know what that what that is. That's just. Uh, it's cynical, but it's that thing. And I, I remember Jay Lynch telling me stories like he would just put his garbage pail kids illustrations into like a, a brown paper sandwich bag and like take them into the studio and stuff. And then there would be kids there with like leather leather portfolios and shit uh, who like have these beautiful, you know, like it's Mad Men type level of presentation, garbage ass work, you know? And it, it's like, it's like when you go on the running trail on January 2nd, <laughs> and you see a lot of, you see a lot of people with those very expensive runners outfits and the, like the $200 water bottle. 
then you'll see them on January 3rd. Right. That's that shit, dude. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I have one of those portfolios, and it is from that era. <laughs> like, sure. whenever I was, <laughs> probably in, in school even, yeah. uh, showing my, my lousy samples to uh, indie publishers. That shit is lacing on the cake, you know? And and then even at this point, I mean, we, we were at conventions where people showed us their portfolio, and it's unwieldy and super giant and hard to even hold. Take your time. Editors don't want to hear you can do five pages a day until you can do two good pages a day. That seems self-evident. Yeah. Um, don't waste their time. And it's almost the same deal. Like, fuck ten pages. Like, give me a couple pages of your best stuff. Uh, there was more to say, but I think it's, uh, it has to do with some of the other numbers. Okay, fair enough. But they go on to say, like, you know, the first couple pages are penciled, and then as you go through, it's almost like stick figures. Again, it feels self-evident. You see, you say that I have human examples of each of these. So it's, so it's, it's true. So You're it's right. not. You're like, right. Like there are people who are daft as fuck. Okay, and fair they, enough. And they need to read this. I also think if you really do need that, you're not going to make it. That's true. Because in those, in those same examples, it's not, it's not like there's a light bulb that goes off. They go into their hole and become an assassin for making comics. Like, you know, they're misguided. Know the basics. Don't just learn to draw from comics. Um, is, is what Capullo says in the very first paragraph there. Which, and, is, which is funny because Todd McFarlane would say the opposite. <laughs> very true. He really would. He's like, we're making comics. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe X this one. Just make good comics, and how you get there doesn't really matter. Um, hey, I want to note something about this ad. I was yeah. looking at this ad, and I have this issue where uh, Alan Moore takes over uh, writing Wildcats. No... Uh, Dude, you're missing more pieces, man. Somebody, is, dude, your same guy is jacking off to fucking Witchblade drawings. You're gonna have to use my thing, dude. Oh shit. Yeah, you gotta use my thing right. for the last bit. So, I, like, I could you, you tap in real quick. Yeah, I'll say. Um, but my point here, no number of what issue this is. <laughs> right. Like, you go to your store and be like, I want that new, uh, the new Wildcats direction. Uh, I don't know what issue it is. Just, just hook me up where Wildcats starts in this new direction. Yeah, especially the guys who are running comic shops. Because, like, nobody who is behind the counter of a comic shop co-signed the Image Cats. Like, <laughs> right. I can't imagine, like, any shop that I went to in Pittsburgh where, you know, Wayne is like, oh, it's going to be issue 21. Right, exactly, yeah. Like, that ain't happening, man. <laughs> Mr. I'd... Is going no. to know that? <laughs> <laughs> but you'd think the Wild Storm ad guy would know it. Hey, I have to give. Uh, we have to see what was ripped out of this thing. So here's here's the other page that uh, somebody took home with them. Exactly, from my copy. man. Like, uh, <laughs> and and, you, and now your copy is by me, and I'm afraid I'm gonna catch something <laughs> from it. Monkey pox or some shit. Uh, but I mean, this is another piece of evidence of like paradigm shifting comics because this it really re is. rejuvenates. Mark Silvestri. This is Silvestri line. starting Top Cow too. Yeah, uh, maybe a little bit before this, but the direction Top Cow starts to go, like Witchblade, really was the, the book that I think turned them around. Look at all these shell companies he has, man. Like, what kind of weird game is he running? Did he learn from the Eternity comic guys to have? Dude, you know, did he learn from businesses from uh, Jim Lee? Because this is still Aegis Entertainment and Wildstorm. You know, yeah. eventually it's all Wildstorm, but it starts as Aegis. So like. They were all doing this, and that might be a piece of, we started Image, oh shit, we need to have our own company, I don't know what a good name is, Ballistic Studios, and yeah. then I would have stuck maybe with that one instead of Top, Top Cow seems like a weird name, but I mean, both of those dudes are doing it. Rob Liefeld's doing Extreme and Maximum, so yeah. I don't know, you know, it's it's a lot of decisions that were made quick, and maybe they uh, they kept re revising them right. over time. So, so you missed, here, Flip the page because you missed some really cool piece yeah like so so pencil or ink this is that thing where if you want to be a penciler be a penciler send penciling submissions uh don't just send fully inked things because maybe you're you're a good penciler but your inking sucks so you just lost yourself a job maybe your inking is astounding and if they see the pe pencils where they started and where you took them you get a gig for you get a gig for that and this is really consistent yeah. Any any submission guides that I would see set a version of this. Absolutely, man. Listen, don't talk. This is something that uh, was important then, and I would say is six times more important now with all that people growing up who had helicopter parents who told them they were so great and everything. Shut your fucking mouth. Don't defend your position. Listen to what your elders are telling you. If you want a job with those said elders, go home and, and fix it. Or go somewhere else, you know? I Like, this is that shit, like, in art school where there would be arguments and dudes, like, leaving the room and slamming doors. And uh, I see it at conventions all the time. 
and even you know every now and then when people like come up with the, with their submissions like to 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 us and it's like you say some stuff and it, you could be saying like what's good about it and then they will start to like discredit themselves in front of your face so it's like okay so so this is just cognitive dissonance here you're you're showing this ostensibly because you won't work and now you're like unselling yourself what the fuck is the point of that yeah i've heard stone cold steve austin tell stories about driving down the road with dutch mantel when stone cold was new and same version dutch mantel being like you got nothing to add to this conversation you're, you're just listening yeah <laughs> yeah it's uh it's really good advice especially for a critique i know um uh, writers workshops where whenever the writer's story is being critiqued the writer's not speaking like you're not allowed you know it's it's uh this is the turn to hear feedback on your story it's not your turn to <coughs> it's not your turn to sell your story you know the story selling was in your text so now listen up and i think uh with the same bit as you said about like the pet you know the pages of sketchy stuff like that person's probably not going to make it the writer who wants to get better is going to just shut their mouth and take fucking notes. Like, the one who just wants unanimous praise or just, a, like, a pat on the back for crossing the finish line, that's the hobbyist. I often say with this kind of thing, it's like, I already know what I think. Yeah. I don't need to add to this conversation. Right. Um, pray for a recovery. You mentioned this a minute ago, and the story here is because comics are in a slump at this point, there are a lot of good pros that are out of work, so it could be really tough to break in right now if you're new. Absolutely, man. So then you, it, it just sort of ends off, you got places where you could submit stuff. I absolutely utilize this, sent, sent work to people, unanimous rejections. But uh, what is real cool, we've been seeing these mm -hmm. photographs peppered throughout this whole thing. And they basically kayfabe, you know, it's an after mag. So they did an after photo s session with this fella and uh, Mark Silvestri. And this dude is ending up doing like velocity miniseries and stuff for for uh top cow not just that silvestri offered to pay his expenses to move to santa monaco okay. to, to join top cow gotta be part of this studio pretty interesting his path because like he broke in kind of he had some story work but yeah. it wasn't full time or whatever and then he used that as samples to keep kind of moving through the uh the ranks but yes. it was uh you know they say keep at it and his story is pretty good proof of that because you think oh i've been published now but then the phone stops ringing so, not that easy. Uh, coming to America, rising superstars Mike Diodato Jr. and Roger Cruz uh, talking about this wave of Brazilian artists. And most of that is based on there's an agent in Brazil that's repping these artists. There's an, a guy in America, Dave Campiti, who had published um, Eternity Comics. Uh, innovation. In innovation, yeah. innovation, yeah. And so, you know, it's almost like this uh, connection between the two countries in order to facilitate this work and selling these artists. Here's what I'd say about uh, Diodato Jr. In addition to the stuff that he's known for, you know, Wonder Woman and uh, some of the Marvel DC work that he's doing at this time and Image, he also, around like maybe the late 90s, does a bunch of these books for caliber comics, black and white stuff. I think there are maybe books that he had done in Brazil that were then, you know, brought here and published. There's some really cool stuff like that. So if you're into Diodato's work, definitely worth tracking down some of his indie black and white work that Caliber published in the 90s. Now, he's junior, and I didn't quite quite uh, get this straight, but did, wasn't he working since, like, for, for a long time? Or was Mike Diodato Sr. like working since the 70s? I think his dad must. It must have been his Although dad, Although he's right? 32, and so this is early 90s. Yeah, like 70s he could be a would be pushing it. He could be a teenager. Maybe. Yeah, it's possible. But his dad wa was a working artist and I think did some comics. Because so. it says Diodato's first comic book work published in, back in Brazil. But is that junior or senior? Yeah, unclear there. It's, it's got to be him because the article's about junior. So yeah. it's got to be him. So yeah, like uh, Joe Mad, you know, maybe a, a 15 year old or so getting some, some work possibly through his father or, or working maybe as an assistant to him. Um, but yes. You know, a guy who has some some years under his belt by the time he starts to make his debut and starts to do books like Wonder Woman and uh, what's the Thor Glory <laughs> Glory yeah Glory um, Thor revamp is something he's taken on so yeah I remember him being kind of a hot artist around this time you know once he landed like he was already formed because he had been doing work for years and showed up and did good stuff right out of the gate I mean both of these dudes are scooped up by Rob Liefeld right for for his purposes you know like. In the news items earlier, where it was company-centric, Roger Cruz is starting off Youngblood 1. 
Yeah, it's uh, yeah, and alternating like you mentioned doing X Men stuff, yeah. like um, like the high the, profile stuff. The f- previous two issues were, were the first kind of Joe Mad regular run, the Fiat Phalanx Covenant shits, man, and then you get to that, and it's like, oh yeah, that's fucking hard, and then it's like, oh no, it's it's not. Do you know if Cruz is still working? I feel like Diodato, you still see his work a, a good bit here and there. He has a uh, an Instagram uh, that is like his his art has just grown so much. You know, he is not like a copy hack Mm -hmm. that he was when he was 24 years old. He's grown into himself. Pretty interesting. I like that. And and it makes sense since they're doing now American popular American comics, but it's cool to see like now we're getting coverage of Brazilian cartoonists here in wizard. Like this is a good issue of wizard for showing off a lot of different stuff. Yeah. This is like, there are two articles that are kind of the same thing and this is the art centric one, but they couldn't come up with like seven dudes. You know, they got two guys. Um, and Joe Matt, I guess, you know, so three, um, I have no interest in a casting Zero. call for one Wildcats. Never look at that kind of shit. <laughs> Tony uh, Daniel, Tony Daniel, and Alan Moore. Like once Alan Moore starts getting work at Image, he's say, he's doing work for everybody. Give me some more of that, man. Uh, do you have all four issues? I don't know if I have all four, but I definitely think it's worth uh, checking out what we do have because Alan Moore does. We see some of his layouts in in uh, at least issue one. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the first two issues have that sort of stuff. And and this is one of those things where, uh, I swear to God, it was birthed in the letters column. Um, and if it wasn't actually the letters column of Spawn itself, it was the Wizard letter column. I think we, I think we got there. Somebody wrote a letter into Wizard and was like, what would happen if Spawn got bitten by, by a vampire? And the response was like by Todd McFarlane was like, funny you mentioned that. <laughs> and like, like, We're, but that was like a year and a half before this. Yes. You know? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Tony Daniel, one of those guys like that, I think of them as Trump a subsequent... Career. Well, subsequent generations of the image guys, like once somebody started to have some success, did he do X Force for a little bit? I feel like yeah. anybody that did X Force got the invitation to uh, Image. That was the book to get to Image Comics. I, I mean, you could lay it out, dude. It's it's uh, it's Rob Liefeld, then it's like Dan Panosia, Mark Pasella, Greg Capullo, then Tony Daniel. I don't think there's a guy in between them. Yeah, and I think Adam Polina after that, who I don't yeah. know if he did too much at Image, but I remember like all those artists were pretty interesting to me. Got seventy five issues of it myself. <laughs> Yeah, secretly a uh, a good run of comics there, at least from the art side. Greg Capullo, women aren't men in drag, and uh, we see him doing a self portrait of himself. In I drag. would love to see the modern day Greg Capullo <laughs> with that like size Got 32 a lot of hair neck, there. Yes, uh, in in that outfit. Really uh, basic, simple drawing here too. He talks about you know the bone structure being different and does this like half of a male skull underneath there and then like the difference in the bone structure and it's really subtle stuff a jawline slightly different a nose slightly turned down or an eye turned up pretty uh pretty subtle but it stands out effective you know a picture being worth a thousand words um going over now full anatomy and some of the differences and even this idea of more angular lines for the men versus a, a smoother line for women um Pretty basic, straightforward stuff, but uh, fun to see him going through all these drawings. And I like that he does this as like numbered, you know, like here here are the different numbers of each thing to do. <laughs> a rounder butt is funny. <laughs> Give her a hand. Made me think of the Seinfeld episode of Man Hands. You remember that episode? <laughs> nah, I didn't watch that shit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they would cut and it would be like this, like Jerry couldn't open his beer bottle or whatever. And <laughs> they would cut to just like a bodybuilder's hands like opening it. <laughs> Drawing board, always fun. I didn't recognize any of the names on here. I thought this was a pretty cool illustration, so though. So strong, dude. I mean, this it is... It isn't. It doesn't feel overly... Uh, it's not like a stiff photo reference look to me, although there probably is some photo referencing in there, but I thought it looked cool. Yeah, I mean, absolutely inspired by, by Alex Ross. Mm-hmm. I think we could agree. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this dude's a fucking badass, man. Yeah, it looks, it looks neat. That's a name to Google. I was also looking at some of the stuff that's included in here. Like, this is just a swipe from a Punisher cover. And it made me think, I wonder if they're getting fewer right. uh, solicitations for the, or fewer submissions for this, that they're running some of this stuff. I like this Ghost Rider, by the way. I would, I would check out a Ghost Rider comic that looked like that. Sure. Yeah, Jim, that's what happens when you're only selling 500,000 copies of, uh, of the Wizard. The sky is falling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Didn't pay um, any attention to any of this nonsense. The Stallone loves Dread stuff is is a pretty funny article. Stallone's like, I love Judge Dread. I think it's so beyond your wildest dreams. It's hardcore stuff. I'd love to play him again. <laughs> you may not believe it, but this is my favorite comic book. I believe that. <laughs> I, I, I may not believe that you've read uh, two comics. <laughs> <laughs> Man, and what is this? Yeah. 
Denny O'Neill interview. Um, we've seen a good bit of Denny O'Neill coverage in Wizard Magazine. We've talked about him quite a bit in previous videos. I don't have a lot to add from this. It's kind of neat to see his origins through like Charlton Comics. Yes, um, that is pretty, that is super cool because like a lot of artists that he brought over like come from the Charlton days. You know, Dick Giordano. There's a real family tree. Yes, that you can draw, and it begins kind of with Dick Giordano. Uh, the the simple fact that he was like a, a like a beat journalist. See, here's the thing, like we he did talk a lot in pre previous issues th throughout stuff, but it would always be in association with in association with like an article about New Adams or just Batman centric articles and shit. This is a new this is a Denny O'Neill focused piece, so there is some stuff to pull. Absolutely, like the fact that he was a journalist, just wrote for a newspaper, comes from the same town as Roy Thomas writes a good boy, you know, like local boy does good story. And that attracts Roy Thomas enough to give him the writer's test. Tell people what the writer's test is, Jimmy. <laughs> they sent him a couple pages of, I think it was Fantastic Four, to, uh, to script, to basically right. dialogue. That's the writer's test. Just yeah. put, the, put the words in the balloons, man. And, uh, that lets them know if you're, you're good enough. But he was the third man on the totem pole. Yeah, so, while Stan Lee was still in the offices there at Marvel. So that's, that's kind of a neat bit of history. You know, like a guy that's really been everywhere uh, from the Marvel Universe, age of Marvel, uh, up. Yeah, and what's cool is like Roy Thomas was a teacher. And uh, Denny O'Neill was was a journalist. So these are these are like scholarly dudes who are coming into comics, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, you know, then he goes over to Charlton after doing the Charlton stuff. There's one story that he said that gets a lot of credit co called uh, Children of Doom from Charlton Premier 2. Like, I love that comic. I don't know it. It's good stuff. And it's um, it's almost like an X-Men comic. It's kind of post-apocalyptic where like humans where, where go. Where would I see that? You it's, have that issue? I do have it. It's Charlton Premiere number two, so it's a, like a one-shot. You know, it's just a complete story contained in this, like... It's an anthology title, and each issue is a different story. Yeah. But it's a full issue's worth. And it's cool. Some of it's printed in black and white. I always heard that was a deadline issue. Um, I can't remember the, the artist. I, it might be Pat Boyette. I think it is Pat Boyette. And here's the other place you would see it. When Dan Nadell did the second volume of, like, the Art Out of Time, or Art in Time, I think might have been the second one, it was comic book artist. And this is one of the stories that's reprinted in that book. Word. But, but pretty interesting. Part of it is because of the black and white art. And, you know, it's just, it's weird. It's Charlton, so it's, like, a little bit different. Yeah. And uh, the story's cool, this post-apocalyptic story about, like, these mutated kids that come out from the underground in this uh, nuclear wasteland. Definitely a fun one. That might, that might be like, if we ever start the cartoonist kayfabe, like midnight comics or whatever, you know, the cult comics showings, <laughs> um, it'd be the perfect title for it. Look how young he looks here. Yes. That's, uh, that's kind of cool. Yeah, Denny, Denny O'Neill, man, you think about him as like a lifer in comics, like what a career. Talking about applying some of his journalism to whenever they did the drug story in Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and interviewed like um, recovering uh, uh, drug addicts for that story. And he seemed to enjoy the part of, like, the journalist part, like, actually doing some research on it. Born the same month that Detective, Detective Comics 27 came out. So weird. Very scary. <laughs> yeah, like some weird destiny. Also uh, famous for doing the Tony Stark alcoholic stories. That was a Denny O'Neill uh, writing gig. Interesting career, too, because he, he goes back and forth between writing and editing. So, uh, you know, you see a lot of, uh, quite a resume. Yeah. And worth noting, too, for fans watching the show that haven't seen all our videos, we do a pretty good dive through the uh, Green Arrow, Green Lantern issues with uh, Warren Bernard. Yeah. So um, definitely worth checking out that video if you're interested to see more of, of that work. Uh, consider groundbreaking, but he, even he acknowledges, didn't move the sales needle. They got to do interesting work because that book was near cancellation, Green, Green Lantern. And uh, brought Green Arrow in and did these interesting comics that are still celebrated. But, you know, that's the thing. Like, a lot of these comics, if they're a little ahead of their time or whatever, like, it didn't sell a lot of extra copies back then. But how much have those books been reprinted again and again and again? Absolutely. You know, like, DC did all right by those stories. And, uh, and with an editorial mindset, you know, he knows that that is something that can be done. If a book is failing, like, like try some things. So he lets Frank Miller, after a year worth of penciling, write and draw daredevil comics yeah and that was a uh, an issue where roger stern was writing it and roger Frank, mckenzie uh, roger roger mckenzie writing it and uh miller and him creatively had some different ideas and i think like he, he talks about like they were friendly and they, they had a good relationship but miller wanted to write and o'neill had as an editor had to make the choice which uh which horse are you going to back 
And because it's comics and visual, he went with the uh, the hot artist. Uh, that worked out okay. Yeah. I would and whenever Miller leaves, then Denny O'Neill takes over writing Daredevil because that's a tough follow up. You know that book was so hot whenever Miller left, and so he writes it for like the next couple of years. And the one thing he says that's really great is he gets to work with Mazzucchelli. Yeah. So yeah, it's pretty good. I bet as a writer, that's the wet dream whenever you get somebody of that caliber. So Frank Miller turned in a Daredevil comic every three weeks. Yeah. Man, quite quite a career. And then a lot of Batman talk, because that's where he's at at the time, and this is after Nightfall, and so Batman always going to be hot. Creators in Motion, Wizard takes a look at eight of Vertigo's most underrated writing talents, and you can see the list here. Garth Ennis, Elaine Lee, John Nay Reber. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Apologies, John. Ted McKeever, Jerry Prosser, Steven Siegel, Paul Jenkins, Mark Miller. Young Mark Miller. Pretty yeah. fun. So this is this is a fun article. Each one is like a little profile of these writers, and it's cool to see some of these people that we know went on to big things, but in the early stages, talking about where they're at. Preacher's already running, so Garth Ennis is uh, maybe a little further along than some of these writers f- from a career standpoint, but interesting to trace his origins and how he gets to this point. Totally. The underrated part is funny, because like, then who is the high-rated? I mean, is it just Neil Gaiman is the, is the high-rated guy? Yeah, who is else Warren is Ellis? doing stuff there? Grant J- Morrison? Jamie Delano? Grant, Grant Morrison, maybe? I guess that's it, yeah. Yeah, I can't even remember, like, I was thinking of all the Vertigo books that had, like, long runs and big collections, and there are probably a dozen titles that had 50 issues or more. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I don't know the pecking order, you know, because, again, some of that stuff, the, the success is in the book collections, maybe, or, uh, you know, it's, it's different I, different stages of this. I, I remember seeing uh, Garth Ennis when he, like, took over Hellblazer or something. He, I think he took it over from, from Warren Ellis and he was saying that, like, Warren Ellis is, like, studying all these magic books and, like had these, like, grimoires and shit like that. And Garth Ennis is like, it's all bollocks anyway. I'm just making it up. <laughs> like, ain't doing none of that goofy, <laughs> crowley bullshit research. That's funny. Yeah. And that, that'll probably break the heart of so many Hellblazer, like, the people who believe in that Hellblazer stuff. Yeah, it could be. Um, man, there's a lot of these books, too, I just don't remember. Like, Ennis talks about... The book Goddess. Yeah, I, don't I don't remember that at it. all. Yeah, I don't know it at all. I, I kind of remember Vamps Rings a Bell, but I don't remember. I never see this book anywhere. Like, I, it's really out of sight, out it, of mind it's, for it's, me. It's one of those things, man, where when you see a fucking Brian Ballin cover, so often it feels like editorial is like, this art is rushed. This art is hurried. We got to stop people in their tracks. And it really does a disservice to the interior materials, man. It's hard to live because up to a cover like that. Because when you see this, like, as a kid, like, like, I saw these things, and it's like, you're still getting the wool pulled over your eyes and shit and thinking that the interiors are going to look like that. So when you go f- find the issue and you open it, it's just not that. You know, William Simpson, I'm sure, a very accomplished artist, but I've seen these in the dollar bins and stuff, look through them, and I'm like... Nah. You're not going to live up to a bowl and cover. Look at the background stuff. I don't know what he's doing there. This is probably him doing digital, I think, because it looks like his coloring. But I don't know what that background sample is. And Vamps is about a uh, biker, a, a, a girl biker gang of vampires. I'm not getting that from the cover. Because a girl biker gang of vampires sounds really cool to me. If I do come across that in a dollar bin, I may check it out. Um, I don't know how much Elaine Lee went on to do. That's the other thing with some of these writers. Like... Um, the John Nay Reber, I think he might have gone on to Wild Storm. For I've, I've a seen stint. his name a couple, yeah. couple of places. So man. Kind, of, kind of funny to see like where where these uh, where everybody would shake out. She did Starstruck, which is like a big. Oh deal. yeah, Mike Kaluta, right? That's the other thing. Sometimes whenever there are like creative teams, I, I might know the artist more than I know the writer on many of these. Uh, my guy here is Ted McKeever. I'm such a fan of his. Metropool was a, just a gigantic book for me. They, so I followed him through a lot of his Vertigo stuff. They don't expand on it in any way to explain what the fuck he did. Ten years of steady employment with ABC Television. What does that mean? Um, well, also, yeah, I have no idea. Also, he's like was raised in Miami. Forever, I thought this is a Brit. Right. <laughs> and then I thought, for some reason, like Detroit and Michigan, you know, like his stuff's really textural and feels like that post-industrial kind of area almost rust belt like miami's the last place i would have guessed (laughs) for ted mckeever but i dig his stuff but you know what they don't they mention some of his stuff like transit eddy current plastic forks they do not mention metropole right which is crazy to me like that's that's such the big book but maybe i don't know i think that came out before this 
it does highlight that he's doing some like uh, Elseworlds stuff, like a Superman Elseworlds. He would end up doing like Batman and Wonder Woman as part of like a three part uh, Elseworlds kind of th series. Jerry Prosser, that's another uh, writer that I'm just not don't don't know his work. You know, I've seen Skin Graft and some of these comics that are listed, but it's not something that uh, I don't know if he continued making comics or not very much after this. Steven Siegel, um, I know I know him a bit, uh, kind of friendly with him. He's had a long career doing all kinds of stuff, did X-Men for a little bit. I remember bumping into him and talking about, um, like, he was rereading X-Men, you know, for that job. And we were talking about rereading old comics and which ones held up. And I, I don't know how easy it is to read those old X-Men. <laughs> and you could speak to that more than I could. But he's doing um, Sandman Mystery Theater with Matt Wagner at this time, passing off, uh, like, they were taking turns on writing arcs with Guy Davis drawing it. It's got to, again, be the... Uh, the writer's dream whenever you get a really good artist on a, on a project you're writing. Look at how young he is right there, dude. No facial Super hair, young. no suspenders. Yeah. Um, Paul Jenkins, that's, again, a writer I think has been around comics quite a bit. I think he went on to do, um, what was the big Marvel? Origin? Um, Wolverine Origin? Sorry. Oh, maybe, yeah. I was thinking of uh, Sentry. I think he, he might have been a guy connected to that Sentry character. But, yeah, a guy who's been around comics for quite a bit. And uh, Mark Miller... <laughs> which again these these photos are great you yes. know like like a, almost a 30 year old photo so everybody's a kid in these pictures um but it's fun to hear his his thoughts on comics and kind of making comics a little bit more fun and and, and movement and visual and stuff considering like what his career arc has been since then very interesting to get his insight early in his career of uh, what he's planning he's doing swamp thing at the time so kind of a cool swamp thing piece of art there but interesting uh, creator of course and uh, fun to see that early early origins yeah and i feel like they position him as as like the headliner here you know he's he's the guy like leading le like you you end on the high note so i imagine you know they bookend the stuff they have garth ennis up front mark miller at the, at the on the back end and I, I feel like that's that feels right yeah those are probably almost definitely the two biggest writers that come out of this uh this profile yeah a big thing like with steve siegel like, he's part of that man of action shit. So mm -hmm. he has a lot, of, a lot of success in Hollywood, like, just by consortium, by being associated with, like, those other cats. Could win some Stephen Platt profit art. Yeah, that's cut out of your comic, too, by the way. Wow. There must be a titty on some of the <laughs> pages somewhere. Um, I was pretty excited to get this. The toughest team in comics, and they're talking about Big Guy and Rusty the Boy Robot, which we have looked at, Frank Miller and Jeff Darrow's follow-up collaboration to Hard Boiled. And um, they talk about just condensing this down into a very quick article. But for anybody that, that is unfamiliar with those comics, either of those, we've profiled both on this channel. So go check those out, two astounding comics. We've talked to Jeff Darrow quite a bit. Go check out those videos. But they talk about doing this... Um, you know, this is Legend. Dark Horse Legend is up and running at this time. So they're talking about doing a jam comic with Hellboy, Madman, um, Monkey Man, and uh, the big guy fighting Nazis on the moon that Darrow's supposed to draw. I'm so sad that didn't come to, hap to, to pass. Right. I wonder if there's some, some pages somewhere with all of that stuff, uh, you know, a, a few of those characters in Darrow's... Might have to ask Uncle Jeff. Mi mighty hands. But uh, pretty fun to see this profile. Like I said, a loaded issue. And I think we're on the back end of uh, that, the, that load. Yeah, unfortunately, I Palmer's don't care about, uh, about toys. Yeah. Anything video game standouts? Uh, the fact that it's still 16-bit era is interesting to me. I can't believe they still have these comic book IQ. Every, every issue. Yeah, you think that would have faded at some point. But, uh, the nerds love it. Palmer's Picks, a library of fun. We're looking at Acme Novelty Library by Chris Ware. Probably a lot of people's introduction to Chris Ware. Probably mine. Like I, I, I may have had, uh, I may have had Volume Two, Number Two of, of um, Raw, with the Potato Man. Yeah. Strip, but that material doesn't even look like the Chris Ware that's here. It, it's like I always thought that it was a uh, Bill Watterson. Like it felt like the same aesthetic approach mm -hmm. with the with a brush line and all that stuff i was gonna say if that's like the only chris ware you see i don't know if that would have made me a chris ware fan exactly. it's cool to look at now in hindsight because yeah. it's like yeah let's see where this guy comes from but on its own i don't know if it would have been enough to be like oh i gotta follow this dude it stood out and was cool but right. uh, i had that comic because it had jacques tardy naked chicks with big bushes and stuff and it like wow look at these naked ladies so 
he is starting Jimmy Corrigan at this point. Uh, you know, a few issues have been done of Acme Novelty Library, which is good for Tom Palmer Jr. to be able to reference and get a feel of what this artist is all about. Because already at this point, people are recognizing, like, this is a different breed of cartoonist. Like, what he's doing is amazing. And they get into some of his methods. One of the reasons that Ware's work is so fresh is his spontaneous working methods, where he is, like, doing his planning and writing and everything directly on the page. That still blows my mind. Right. Um, Part of a leaf. It really is. But it's it's really interesting to see him laying that out and talking about it, going pretty much panel by panel. That's just a wild way to work. But it does explain why his comics feel different than most of the comics. You know, like whenever I first got hold of a Chris Ware Acme novelty library, it was like, this is something else. Mm -hmm. And I think that's common. I think a lot of people, that was their experience. They certainly had a massive influence on our generation. Totally. I, I remember uh, Connor Steckschult uh, was... Uh, TA for Chris Ware when he was teaching a class at like the Art Institute of Chicago I think is where it went down and he was describing like the way Chris Ware like would would lay out his pages and shit and it was some sort of domestic scene where these characters are interacting and just all the spontaneous stuff would happen where like he wanted the character to like was emoting verbally and was kind of caught off guard emotionally so then stubs their toe and then that creates a whole nother set of events like but that just that just happened on the page like as he's working to sort of bolster that claim because it does feel so hard to believe it almost feels like he's like trying to throw you off of his trail or something like that like yeah you know we make our comics spontaneously these days and somehow he's able to kind of keep it all together in his head and, and and stick the landings more often than not which is a feat unto itself you know but it might also speak to you know, 500 page stories and like Rusty Brown taking 15 years to, to, to make or something like maybe if you planned it out, it's a more brief, tighter work or some shit, but it wouldn't be what it is. Yeah, absolutely. And he talks about, you know, like his background doing weekly deadlines for newspaper comics, because yes. at this point he's doing New City, uh, which is a Chicago paper, I think an alt like an alt weekly kind of paper. Um, cool because he gets to work in color there and he talks about some of that kind of technical side of it working in color learning to reproduce art going all the way back to his days at university of texas this is a great overview for chris ware and an intro and really a lot of valuable information here if you want to know more about the way he works where he's coming from how he how he's gotten to the point of the comics that he makes um really insightful stuff this is a nice article this is the shit like when i was picking these these up and i got rid of my original wizards um, I was not clipping out the the Witchblade stuff for ke the image for keeps. <laughs> I had um, I had a uh, like I bought a scrapbook. Yeah. And I had Palmer's picks. I was gonna say I kind of want to have an issue that's like that where like the Palmer's picks is the stuff that's cut out. Yeah. That would be a young, young Eddie P Comics uh, right. collection there. Um, also gives so he gives credit to a guy like a technical guy who worked in the camera room at college for helping him understand re how to reproduce art and make art that that was reproducible and, and reproduced well and then also singles out kim thompson at fanographics and some of the stuff that kim thompson helps him with from punctuation to uh even going out of his way to make every issue perfect by suggesting upgraded paper stocks and better printers it's really insightful to me because that's the stuff I associate with Chris Ware. And it's like he's happy to give credit to people who helped him along the way with that information. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Dan Klaus also cites uh, Kim Thompson as the guy he, that he was angry at when he was asking Fantagraphics, can I change format? Can I do things uh, some different sizes and stuff? I hate this fucking comic book format. I've done enough in that dimension, in that scale. Can we do something else? And they said no. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then this kid comes along. Every issue completely different. Yeah, amazing stuff. This is a really good Palmer's pick. And by the way, like uh, another place where I saw early Chris Ware was, I think it might have been the like the bongo co drawing on the cover, Matt Groening interview issue of Comics Journal, like in the initial news items. It was in the days when Chris Ware was just doing Quimby comics and, for the newspaper. And they were remarking and highlighting on his his technical prowess and, and that he does his own separations and stuff. And they showed some of that shit. A.K.A. Goldfish. Brian Michael Bendis' series of, uh, you know, these crime comics. 
might be the first time Brian Michael Bendis' name has appeared. We've seen it Goldfish is. listed, but the actual name, that right. might be the first uh, the first listing of his name. Absolutely. And I thought, like, might be worth looking at one of those comics yeah. sometime. Manga scene, uh, two controversies. One is whenever they're repackaging manga in America and pulling out pages, and they do uh, a couple pages from Ghost in the Shell that were a little too sexy that got pulled. One from My the Psychic Girl uh, that got pulled. And pretty much the remark is, you know, this stuff's just viewed differently in Japan. Yeah, and and uh, we we did a Ghost in the Shell yeah. episode, and I had no idea no. That, uh, that there was stuff taken out, but people in the audience sure did. And they and they uh, reminded us that uh, yeah, the other was like uh, na- nakedness that was cut out, but Leia Hernandez here is uh, letting us know that it was it was uh, Masamune Shiro's choice. Yes, right. To take those pages out of the uh, Dark Horse joint. There's other stuff too, man. Like Li- Libra Torres, Rank Xerox got changed to age in some of his characters because they're running around naked, and and uh, you just can't be doing that in in America. Yeah, if somebody were really interested in it, you could do a whole book on these kinds of like subtle changes. And I mean, it's it's done all over the place. That's a like, Paul Gravatt kind of thing to do, man. Like that Mangasia book probably could cover some of that stuff. Well, I mean, even like movies, I think they get changed a little bit if they're on planes. Or uh, for a while, it was like Blockbuster in Utah, I think, would have its own set of changes to certain movies that they were selling. So yeah, that makes uh, so much. I, I, there, I there's a history of that. Movies, yeah. Um, and then the other part that's controversial is this bootlegger stuff. So obviously like fan translations of manga and anime bootlegs have always been a part of, I think this Japanese art in America. That's fascinating. And so this is a bunch of publishers and media companies like trying to control this, you know, forming a conglomerate to try to regulate this stuff. And, uh, trying to turn people to tattletales. Yes. That's that next generation. That, that's those, that's those like, this is not okay. Brand of, uh kids that are out there now man ready to nork it's a it's a i think this is a really interesting concept you know about like the pirates because so much of it is also how this stuff was built like there was an audience that was being served by these pirates before a bunch of publishers and importers were on board yeah and you know it's chicken and egg in a lot of ways like you need that audience for this stuff to thrive and these pirates are really built that audience they were like generation one of building that audience sure and at a certain point you got to grow up grow up and fucking do it legit and go go straight and do it properly or else you get weeded out man uh fuck dude i remember like in times when we were actually hanging out at that same pittsburgh comic-con where we were in that alley with the ac comics guy that was like still when it it was like the clamshell cases Mm -hmm. of just like all kinds of shit and it was that year like i totally remember it because san diego comic-con like our convention would happen in april san diego would happen in like June or July or whatever. And it was at that San Diego where like legit the feds were there and like cracked these dudes down. And it's the same dudes that were at the Pittsburgh joint. You know, these are a carny guys who just fucking do this shit every weekend. And at that time it felt, it felt like it was too much. Like there were dudes selling R. Kelly sex tapes and shit like that. And it's like, this is beyond just bootlegging now. Now it's like potentially illegal. Yeah pornography that that they have on the top of a table that like anybody can fucking buy right. like this feels like That's, really fucked up that is the problem <laughs> <You> know, like, <laughs> like nobody's gonna regulate themselves on any anything <laughs> cool article though i like that one too for uh getting some some real insights into what's going on in that in that corner of comics at the time you remember that era so much <clears throat> man definitely Cards are still a gigantic part. So many card ads. Not even yeah, it hasn't even hit the critical mass, you know, until until Pokemon for like five years later. Probably longer than it actually. Uh Comic Watch, first Mike Diodato, Wonder Woman issues. Uh had about a year run on those and you know, hot artists, so that used to be a thing that, that you would collect like early appearances of these hot artists. I still do. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was still uh, kind of the norm. And then the uh, Flash comics, I don't know. I mean, it's Bar- a- Barry Allen. This is continuity. You know, it's it's uh, Barry Allen wife kind of story. So within uh, continuity. And then picks from the Wizard's Hat. Mark Wade starting his Captain America run, which would get controversial as we get into like the Heroes Reborn and that getting canceled. Because people dug it from the start, really. Yeah, Ron Garney, the uh, the artist on there too. So it is that team. Dark Seed versus Dark Side versus Galactus, The Hunger. This is the John Byrne crossover. And I was trying to figure out, like, is this after he had done 
uh, Jack Kirby's Fourth World series. Yeah, anyway. I'm not sure either because there was an ad for New Gods earlier on in this issue, but pretty cool. And again, Marvel DC, man, the crossovers are, st are starting to flood. Yes, they are. And uh, you can see what the price of a comic is, $1.50. That's a $5 joint. I remember it was a lot of thinking, big decision to buy that Spawn Batman for 5 bucks. I saw this one on the racks and I, I let it go, so I, so I never bought it. This is good stuff. A lot of Kirby, you know, Burn wearing his uh, Kirby love on his sleeve in there. Avengers Ultra Force. I think Marvel has bought Malibu at this point. So Absolutely, not yeah. exactly a crossover, although it's like a universe crossover. Noteworthy for me because uh, George Perez doing artwork. Yeah. Akira, number 34, the final issue after a three friggin' years of waiting. The final issue. Wish I would have picked that up at the time. Totally, dude. Uh, because you finish a story... But then there's like Larry Hama, Mark Texiera stories in there. You know, there's there's a bunch of like little side stories that are by like the Marvel bullpen guys. Joe Mad does up some pieces. It's where you get to see the Mobius, like Tetsuo drawings and shit. Like that's a, that's a great and and that's the one that like people sell lots of uh, Akira, the yes. uh, the epic stuff for last I checked was about five hundred bucks and most of that money is for the last issue. Yeah, it's, it must have been a very low print run, uh, you know, to be the cost that it is. I was just in Italy, and I saw several sets of Akira, the collections, and uh, the books are so nice. Each one has, like, the colored edges of the pages. So, like, one volume is yellow, one volume is That's red. It. They're striking, That's man. It. Really beautiful books. Dark Horse 100 is being promoted, and we saw we looked at that Gen 13, issue 13 ABC. Uh, I think there's six issues of Dark Horse presents 100 a b c d something like that yes point one, point two, something like that yeah i think i i think i picked those up at the time this might have been packaged if it wasn't if it wasn't this issue of wizard it was the same issue like the same month hero illustrated uh that came out polybagged with a preview comic with this cover um as the as the preview comic and uh it had uh the two page like joe sacco Harvey P. Carr story where Harvey P. Carr is just eating oranges and spitting seeds in the trash and putting them in there. It's the most beautifully drawn thing ever. And I remember thinking, like, holy fuck, Harvey P. Carr, he's still around. That's fun. He's still making shit. Punk's number two. This is the uh, Keith Giffen comic that is so bizarre. Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, I have issue two. I don't know if all four were, were printed. I don't right. remember seeing issue three and four. But if you read this, it's... Uh, Starts off with a standard comic book fight scene and then turns into an appendix to Scott McCloud's understanding comics and Scott himself walks in. It's a good, it's a wild comic. Some weird formal stuff in that issue. Kurt Busiek's Asher City number one is yeah, showing Yeah, that's up. a big one, right? Yeah. I mean, think of the legs on that thing. I think that's still being published in some form or fashion now. Uh, she and Cyblade crossover. This is noteworthy to me because like the Gen 13, issue 13, you have a whole bunch of these different characters, uh, you know, like indie creator-owned characters making appearances. Yeah. You know what's cool about that Astro City, man, is uh, Kurt Busiek, writer of Marvels, like, was able to get fucking Alex Ross cover on your creator-owned book from yes. somewhere else. So, like, that's doing favors, man. Absolutely. Yeah, that was one of those books whenever we talk about, you know, comics in their dark 90s time period that a lot of retailers and old-time fans I know would be like, yeah, Astro City. That's yeah. the one to read. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing too exciting to me in the top 10 comics. Same round of stuff, you know, like uh, the same stuff that was there in the, in, the, in the last round. Maybe this is a new piece. Mm-hmm. But, uh, Jimmy, you're going to have to accept it, and you're going to have to bite the bullet, man. We're going to have to do X-Men Alpha, X-Men Omega, and a bunch <laughs> of the Age of Apocalypse books. There's going to be big videos for us. Wizard Market Watch techno comic books. Getting love in this. Yeah, man. I mean, they bought five ads the previous issue. <laughs> Very yeah, fair. That and and like by the way, the, the following is uh, the Bad Girl books and then Double Impact. So don't get too excited by this. <laughs> this is not their best reporting. It's just one of those great examples, you know, like those she books that like you legitimately get for a quarter now, 40, 50 bucks yeah. in the pages of Wizard Price Guide. Yeah, for sure. THB, they're giving a little love to independent comics. Yeah, it's cool to see THB listed. 
um, Tick. I, I think Tick cartoon is going on at this point, yeah. so it makes sense that that would be uh, one of the one of the standout books. It was always praised, and in, in even older things before there was TV shit. Yeah, it would always be highlighted and trumpeted as as a as a as a strong book. We 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 did a bit on issue one, but we got to do vids on the other 11 issues yeah i like those books and i got those whenever i was young enough to uh you know they were just enjoyable like they were just really cool and showed me something different they were like that early wave for me of black and white indie books where it was like this is super cool it and it would be like i would look forward to like the two hours it would take to read those 12 issues of ben edlin ticks it would be like a two-hour thing and i would do almost every weekend you know like i had my 100 comics and those would be at the top of the list like i'm just going to read through ticks again um, Brandon Choi, number two, hottest writer. Him and No Game and battling for the top spot. <laughs> but but in the runnings, man, Scott Lobdell and Dan Jurgens. Yeah, there's a lot, uh, a lot there. I, I just can't. <laughs> Wait, it'd just be mean. It would be. But you can't say it's punching downwards, man, because those guys have way bigger houses than we ever will, probably. That's true. Fun to see Dave Gibbons, thirty years ago. Miracle Man issue 15 is still a $2 book, so it's not there yet, but it's going to be soon, man. Like, there's going to be that good and cheap, like where we saw that Flash comic and, and uh, whatever that thing was above. When it gets highlighted there, you start to see the price increase in the price guide. New Mutants 87 is down to $30. I think it was around like 90 maybe around its peak. Terra Luna. I think we just round things off with the, with the Todd piece and we're done, man. Yeah. Todd McFarlane's sensitive side, talking about the movies he likes. Only saw one Star Wars, never bothered to see Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi. He's, Hasn't seen any Star Trek movies or dis- True Lies or Cliffhanger. He's dispelling the prejudices of the people who think that he's such a bro that he's just trying to watch Die Hard Moo type and Steve Seagal movies all day. And he's like, listen, bud, I'm just trying to watch movies that would be called The Great American Novel, like When Harry Met Sally... <laughs> or Radio Flyer. Yeah. Or the Shawshank Redemption. Yep. It's uh, interesting. And... What a weird article. Like, at this point, like, I feel like every issue I think he's done with it, with this column. I don't know how long this runs, but it feels like every issue, like, that's got to be it. He's just bored. This is this is that kind of thing, too, where uh, when we did our shoot interview with him, and we were like, Todd, man, we're going to ask you all the questions that we at, like want to talk about if we, if we cut dinner with you at San Diego Comic Con. And he said... Well, we wouldn't even be talking about comics. Like, he, he, he ain't trying to hear that. <laughs> no. He doesn't know what's going on with comics. He spends a paragraph criticizing speed and, and how he would behave if he was on that bus. <laughs> he was completely upset <laughs> that these guys are on a, what is in effect, a missile going 40 miles per hour. Cracking jokes. Everybody's cracking jokes. Yeah. How people stuck on a death trap would crack jokes. I would be thinking about my wife and kids. And then I might crack a joke... Maybe four or six weeks later. Yeah, it's a pretty funny article, but again, like... And then he solicits, Hey, if you have certain tastes in movies and care to share them with me, write to me at the address in Spawn. <laughs> That's a funny plug for your book. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, Kevin Dooley, editor at, uh, at DC Comics, and uh, I didn't take anything too much away from this, although he did spend a stint at Amazing Heroes, which is kind of cool, because that's a magazine that I liked. Yeah. There, there's, there's one quote that didn't age well can i can i read it no um (laughs) i wrote junk mail copy for 10 years i was the guy who wrote the crap to convince people to buy stuff they really didn't need i had finally reached a point where i was getting ready to get a high-powered scope rifle and start picking people off so i quit took a job in a bookstore took a twenty thousand dollar pay cut and was never happier in my life well you know ed you say that doesn't age well that's advice I'd like a lot of people with uh, high-powered rifles to take. Change your, change your position? That's right. Instead of actually getting the rifle, <laughs> change something else in your life. See if you can uh, can go a different find, direction. Find some happiness. But, uh, yeah, it did, did end up with, I think, a two-year stint at Amazing Heroes magazine. So thank you for your service at that, Kevin. <laughs> much much better time spent. <laughs> right. So another issue of, uh, of Wizard in the can, and like I said, this was a pretty good issue for me. There were, there were quite a few uh, articles and profiles that I thought were, uh, that, I, that I found interesting, happy to read about. Yeah, yeah, there's still reasonably solid stuff going forward, and, and uh, it is certainly a snapshot. This issue, I do think, uh, compared to any of the more recent ones that we looked at, 
really is the indicator of where comics will be going for the next five five years, ten years um, after after this point for sure. Yeah, and I mean it's September ninety five, so all our talk about comics going, you know, hit, kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel in the nineties, we're not there yet. There's there's <laughs> still, I mean, you know, Marvel's ninety six is is bankruptcy, so there's still uh, it's going to keep going lower. Like the the people who are hoping for a rebound or seeing signs that things are improving, those signs are not not accurate. Yeah, like you said, man, like like uh, Mark Wade just started that Captain America gig, so like it's going to become a kind of a darling uh, unexpectedly and, you know, and probably less than a dozen issues we might get Heroes Reborn. Yeah, that sounds about right. It's sometime in 96, so yeah. it won't be too long. Fascinating glimpse of uh, comic book history. Jimmy, you good to go? I am. Kay Fabers, like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell, we'll notify you when new vids are available. It's out there, man. Hulk Grand Design, the oversized treasury collection. Go pre-order it today. Now is the time to pick that up. Uh, let your comic shop know that you want it. Let Marvel know that you want it. And that is the Hulk Grand Design Treasury Edition Collection. And join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see a lot more of my art and comics. Red Room Trigger Warning Straight Paperback is going to be in stores this September. Uh, the final order cutoff is really soon, which means you need to let your comic shop know that you want this thing. You need to put in your pre-orders uh, ASAP. You can do that at your shop on Amazon. Hit up my link tree in the description below this video. You can uh, order the comics that way. Uh, if you want to read those, the next round of Red Room Comics, hit up my Patreon. I'm serializing the next uh, round of strips that will be coming out in 2022 before they hit paper. Thank you so much to the new... Uh, to the new subscribers that have uh, showed up uh, this, this past week. Um, keep showing up. There's going to be new strips every Tuesday. There's more than 300, almost 300 pages up there right now. What else do we have, Jimmy? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Another great way to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel, given those marching orders will be on our way. Read more comics.